Matthew chapter 5. A lot of people talk about the Beatitudes and they really don't do it justice because they remove Christ from the context he's talking about. Christ is not speaking outside of the context of everything that's been said before Matthew, meaning the Old Testament. Everything he's about to quote here, he's quoting from Psalms and from Isaiah. Every single one of them. And he's calling out a new nation of believers out of Israel who have trusted that he's the Son of God. And so in Matthew 5, 1, he says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, the, his disciples came unto him. Now, who's these multitudes? Look back in 424. He's preaching in the, in the uh, synagogues of Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then in verse 24, his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had palsy. And he healed them, and there followed him great multitudes of people. So there they are. Now when he sees them, he separates himself. What would he do that for? Well, Moses did the same thing. Moses said, there's going to be a prophet like unto me, and him shall ye hear, and whoever doesn't hear him shall be cut off from his people. Moses went and got that law, came down, told the 70. And the 70 taught the children of Israel. That's exactly the same thing that's happening here. Christ gets this law, preaches to his disciples. His disciples are going to go out to that multitude and preach these blessings and this righteousness. Verse 2, it says, He opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Psalm 34. He didn't say blessed are the poor. He said blessed are the poor in spirit. Now what does that mean? Well, the communists like to use this verse to perpetrate that Christ would um, be an advocate of you know, social justice or whatever. This is talking about people who are broken in spirit because of sin, not because of financial situation. Look at Psalm 34, 18. Look what he says. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. James said, Do you not know that God hath chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, and promise to them that love him? What, is, what did God say in Isaiah 66? He looked to those who were of a poor and contrite spirit, and those that tremble at his word. Okay, the modern communist does not tremble at God's word today. They, they make fun of Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible is who they make fun of. And they make fun of us for believing it. But Christ is not speaking outside of the context of everything that's been said. Look back in Matthew 5 again. He's about to quote another psalm. He's about saying 5, 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Where is he quoting from? That's Psalm 55. You don't have to turn there, I'll just read it for you. Attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me and in wrath they hate me. There's the mourners right there. Now where's their comfort? Their comfort's in verse 17. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice he hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. For there were many with me. God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old Selah, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. And so he, and Christ is putting it on these disciples. If you look in Luke, Luke 6, he said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom. So it's the, it's the disciples who are the poor in spirit. It's the disciples who are the ones that mourn. And verse uh, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's an exact quote from Psalm 37 11. The meek shall inherit the earth. He's not talking outside of a context of the Bible. Well, what's he instituting? Well, he, like I said, he's instituting a new nation that the kingdom of God is going to come to and the kingdom of God is going to reign through them in Israel. That's who he's talking to. This is what he's come to do. Verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's Isaiah 65, where he says in Isaiah 65, in the context of Isaiah 65, verse 13, <clears throat> actually in verse 12, the context is he numbers, God numbers them, the uh, wicked, the ones that forgot him, he numbers them to the sword, and they all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, ye did not answer. 
It's first coming. He's calling. That's what he said he came to do is call sinners to repentance, right? They didn't answer. When I spake, ye did not hear. That's Matthew 13. But did evil before mine eyes and did choose that wherein I delighted not. What she told you in Isaiah 1 is he didn't delight in the blood of bulls and goats. They didn't accept him. They kept the sacrifices. Okay, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. So somebody is... Uh, those who are hungry and thirsting after righteousness, they're filled. And the people who ain't looking for it are hungry, thirsty, and they have sorrow and vexation of spirit. So he's separating the nation. He said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. To turn the father against the mother, and the brother against the brother and the sister, and all that stuff. He's separating the nation here. Those who are thirsting after righteousness versus those who are, you know, trying to uh, uphold their own righteousness. Uh, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. This is an exact quote from Psalm 18, where he says, With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. Verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's the ultimate question in Psalm 24. Who's going to ascend in thy tabernacle or in thy holy hill? Those, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. So the one who has a pure heart is going to see God. That's what he said. <clears throat> Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now this is actually something in contrast to Psalm 82, verse 6 and 7, where he says, defend the fatherless, judge the poor, relieve the oppressed. He says, they know not, they walk in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. He's setting up a new government to where the foundations of the earth are not going to be out of course. They are going to defend the fault. They're going to be making peace. They're going to be restoring people back to God because those gods in Psalm 82 were not doing it. Verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter says the same thing. 3, 14. But if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror. Neither be troubled. You know when the disciples got whipped in Acts 4, they praised God that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ? I mean, that, that's an attitude change. The world doesn't have that. A lot of Christians don't have that, but they should. If you take the name of Christ serious and understand what He's done for you, He was, he was bruised and striped for you. And it, it's, it's, it's a small thing for us to even suffer reproach. And Peter's telling you, happy are ye and don't be troubled and be terrified. Paul said the same thing, and nothing terrified of your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation. For it is given unto you, it is given unto you on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Amen. That's what he said in Philippians. So in verse 10, they're called the, uh, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now there's kind of a structure there. Because in verse 3, the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In verse 10, those who are persecuted, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So between that, you have mourners comforted, the meek's inheritance, the hungry filled, the merciful obtaining mercy, the pure in heart seeing God, and peacemakers called God's children. That tells you who's the poor in spirit and who's going to be persecuted. It's those who have God's uh, providence given to them. But it's not because of them. It's because the kingdom of God will be in them. Because the life of Christ will be made manifest in them. And he's not really expounding all that yet. He's coming to teach the law, to fulfill the law. And we're going to get into what that actually means too. Because uh, people sell that short. Look at verse 511. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. What did Peter say? If any man suffer as a Christian, let him glorify God in this. That's what he said in 1 Peter 4. Now look at verse 12. Rejoice. When they persecute you, rejoice. Happy are ye, and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. That indicates who the persecutors are. It's the Jewish nation against other Jews in that nation. 
What's the issue? One believes Jesus was the Christ and the other ones don't. What did Christ say? A prophet's not without honor, save in his own country? Save in his own country. You know what Hebrews 10, look at Hebrews chapter 10. It echoes the same thing. This is the ministry of the New Testament, guys. This is actually stuff, uh, this is like experiential doctrine that is not just different between the church and Israel. New Testament's the New Testament. The spirit of the New Testament functions the same way, has the same righteousness. And it's by faith. So everything we're reading right now is about, it's going to be applicable to the Christian. No way around it. Look at 1034. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. It's the same thing he said in Matthew 5. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. You know what the will of God is? It's to get punched in the face when you have to get punched in the face. Or suffer. That's what he's saying. I mean, it, God is not called, he's never told the church that the, the, the existence of the church is going to be easy. And it, it, especially for these Jewish believers, it's not going to be easy for them either. You're going to have tribulation. Christ said that. In the world you should have tribulation, but you know, be, not, uh, be not afraid I've overcome the world. Greater is he that is in you than that is in the world. That's what he said. Verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor... Wherever the shall it be salted it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Now in Mark 9, he says, uh, have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. But the salt of the earth, uh, the savor of the salt is for the preservation of the earth. Now what are they preserving on the earth? It's, it's, this God, it's God's righteousness. They're not preserving the earth in its function now. He's given them a righteousness and making them salt that they can preserve that righteousness on the earth. The earth needs a change. And they are the change. They are the light. He's about to say that here in <clears throat> verse 14. Look at verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. The believers here are the light. They're the city that is set on a hill. And if they're set on a hill, they can't be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What did Peter say? Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Peter's a disciple here, here in Christ. And he's echoing the same thing in his epistles. Now he says they are the light, right? Look at John chapter 13. He says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. That's the light. But what, what, look at Titus chapter 3. This is, this is the new nation... The new city that's been given light by Christ. Now here's the, the course of this world that's been going on for so long since Adam transgressed. At Titus 3.3, 3, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Paul's talking about when they were unsaved. That's a natural state of, a, of an unsaved person. They're hateful, they hate one another, and Romans 1 says they hate God. But John 3, or John 13, Christ gives them a new commandment and says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Now, he's not talking about, uh, you know, love in the way the world thinks of love. He's talking about people who love not their own lives to the death, who would love the brethren. That's what he says. Didn't he say in John, uh, He that loveth not his brother is a murderer, and you, have no, and you know that no murderer had the eternal life abiding in him? That's what he said. He said, we know we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. That's not a love that I can just make up by myself, guys. That, that's a love that God has worked in, in me, has worked in every believer who's taken this, this book serious and taken the life of Christ serious. That's something he's working. And they're going to know that this is not just some ordinary, natural, you know, get-along. They're going to know that you are disciples of Christ if you have love one to another. 